The Patwins are part of a group of Indians that spoke a common family of languages all the way from Shasta up to the northern part of Sacramento Valley, right down to our Susan Marsh area. They had a, a lifestyle of a common territory, that is a, a, a large territory, with the major settlements. The Susuns had three different major settlements that we that have been reported. Uh, one likely in Lower Green Valley. Uh, one could have included the Martin site on Susan Valley. And then one on Ledgewood Creek someplace. And one very possibly up at the Pioneer Fruit Farm uh, at the north of the bridge. Then in the winters, they would go uh, come down to the marsh to hunt for birds and capture uh, uh, an anadromous fish. In the summer, they would go up in the highlands, get away from the mosquitoes, and forage for seeds and things like that in their own territory. But they didn't get it in any other person's or any other tribe's territory except by agreement, which they could have gotten because they intermarried with local tribes quite a bit. And it was a question of using natural products and knowing how to handle them and turn them into account. Food, acorns, extremely nutritious uh, seeds of the oak trees, they had abundance here, and they don't have to uh, crush them and uh, leach them of tannin and then cook them in a large basket uh, with techniques of their own without using pots. They use baskets, amazingly, uh, with hot stones, they could do that. And, uh, for housing, they would use naturally branches, uh, uh, trunks of succulent, uh, succulent uh, uh, trees like the willows and bend them over to the top, but they had excellent housing. The peaceful lifestyle of the Patwin Indians soon came to a halt in 1810 when a Spanish expedition under the command of Gabriel Moraga crossed the Carquinas Straits. It was a day-long battle with the Sassoons that started near the present-day Benicia and went all the way to a permanent village site near present-day Sassoon City. And they actually then uh, so badly mauled the Indians that the warriors, 120 warriors, they counted them, uh, hid in their uh, communal shelters, their big communal shelters. Uh, and then the first two then, the Indians of the a group torched them. It was May, everything was dry. They burned them up and they got killed. And the last group were in the third uh, house, uh, council house, and uh, they were asked to by the Moraga, the Gabriel Moraga, to come out. And of course they wouldn't do it. They knew what would happen to them. So then the Indian allies torched that one and they all were consumed in flames. And the myth that comes down, which is completely false, that they chose to be in there, and they'd rather die than surrender, and they were singing songs. Oh, and they put the, their building to fire by themselves, can you imagine? But we have the actual report of Moraga sent to the Viceroy about what truly happened. Several of the Indian children were captured and sent off to missions. Among those captured was a young boy whose Indian name was Sina. Many called him Semyedo. The term Semyedo is a descriptive epithet, meaning brave hand, which was attributed to him at an unknown time and place. Sina was born about 1800 in Sassoon Valley. He was brought to Mission Dolores in present-day San Francisco, where he was baptized on July 24, 1810. The name of Sina, or Semyedo, soon vanished, and he took on the Christian name of Francisco Solano. Between the years of 1810 and 1823, Francisco Solano spent his time as an Indian convert at Mission Dolores. In 1824, he was among the 602 Mission Indians who were transferred from the missions to work and live at the newly established Mission of San Francisco Solano in Sonoma. From 1824 to 1834, he served at this mission as a head Indian with the title of Acalde. By 1834, Comandante Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, of whom the city of Vallejo is named after, 
took control of the Sonoma mission and established the Pueblo of Sonoma. Solano served Vallejo as a labor boss in charge of ex-mission Indian converts and recently captured Indians who were put to work on Vallejo's projects. Vallejo commissioned Solano to become a captain in the Mexican army. In this role, he was active in Vallejo's quest to subdue hostile Indian tribes from 1834 to 1843. In 1837-38, the smallpox epidemic broke out on the northern frontier where, the, where Vallejo was and Solano was uh, as part of the new Pueblo, which they set up to replace the mission, a secular town. Uh, it had come down reportedly from uh, uh, Ross, Fort Ross, from the Russian encampment there. And uh, there was a certain amount of vaccine available and it, it's reported that one, uh, Solano got a shot of this vaccine. How many other Indians uh, under Vallejo's uh, scrutiny or control got it, I don't know. But certainly the Indians further out that were not living at the mission died in very large numbers. On January 4th of 1850, a committee chaired by General Mariano Vallejo recommended the creation of 18 counties. By February 18th of 1850, the California legislation created the 27 counties in the state of California. Among those established was Solano County. The city of Benicia became the county seat. On September 9th, 1850, California became the state of California. In 1851, Captain Robert Henry Waterman sailed a clipper ship called the Challenge from New York to San Francisco. The crew of this voyage was very inexperienced. For many of them, this was their first time at sea. He treated his crew very poorly during their long voyage. This backfired on Waterman when his crew mutinied. When they arrived in San Francisco, Waterman faced the court on charges from the crew accusing him of murder and other atrocities. Though the courts found in favor of Waterman, the trial scarred his reputation, forcing him to give up his life at sea. He did not retire without ambitions, though. Waterman's next dream was to become the founder of a great city. This dream began when Captain Archibald Ritchie purchased the entire Sassoon Rancho from General Vallejo and sold Captain Waterman an undivided one-third interest for $16,000. Several months later, Ritchie died of a heart attack, and Waterman soon took control of the 17,752-acre rancho. In 1856, Waterman plotted a town site and named it Fairfield, after Fairfield, Connecticut, where he was raised. Soon after the town of Fairfield was plotted, Waterman promoted the moving of the county seat from Benicia to Fairfield. By 1858, it was clear that a more centrally located county seat was needed to accommodate the growth of the region. He offered 16 acres called Union Square to the county, plus four adjacent blocks to the town of Fairfield, and his personal bond of $10,000 if the movement succeeded. On September 18, 1858, a countywide election showed the votes, 1,029 for Fairfield, 625 for Benicia, and 10 for Vallejo. The town of Fairfield was now the county seat. Waterman provided the temporary office spaces until a jail and brick courthouse were completed by 1860. Pacific Portland Cement Company was one of the biggest cement manufacturers of the day. After a survey of prospective sites, the cement company found an abundance of raw materials to produce cement on a hill just north of Sassoon City. 
The company wasted no time purchasing 900 acres and spending $500,000 to build a company town. This town was the first town in Solano County, north of San Francisco, to be built with, with underground utilities, sewer, electricity, running water. It had its own ice, it manufactured its own ice. It uh, grew its own beef, its own vegetables. It had uh, schools from grade uh, one through eight. Anybody above that, of course, took the train to uh, Fairfield to Armio High School. When these plants were in full production, uh, manufacturing uh, something like 14,000 bags of cement a day, the dust off these plants and from the quarry was tremendous. Without a, on a day like this, without wind, the dust would kind of hook, kind of just settle, settle onto the ground. So the, the poor women in their washboards and scrubbing uh, buckets were washing every day. It was just a very, very dusty place to live. Uh, people would come from all over this area of California to visit Cement because of the hotel had such a fine staff of uh, cooks and servers, and the Golden Gate Hotel was one of the finest in Northern California when you take away San Francisco and Sacramento, that people would come by special train just to uh, enjoy the cuisine. The plant closed down because of the technology in 1928 to go after the cement on the hill itself. Uh, they only had the uh, steam, steam powered steam shovels and the trains and, and, and the steam powered trains. So it, it's just, it just basically kind of ran out of material. It has been more than 70 years since the cement plant closed down. Today, portions of the old cement town site are located in the county as well as the city of Fairfield. By the turn of the century, our community was able to reflect proudly upon its progress and look forward to the challenges of the future. As the town began to grow more rapidly, it was time to formally incorporate it. The town of Fairfield was incorporated by 77 votes on December 12, 1903. Therefore, be resolved, and it is hereby resolved, that said election was duly and regularly called, and that the vote given and cast at said special election was 130. The total number of votes cast for and in favor of incorporation of the city of Fairfield was 77 votes. The first board of trustees for the town of Fairfield were H.C. Sheldon, the president of the board, Josiah Wing, H.A. Shorey, F.S. Gernetti, W.E. Hammond, T.J. Lenahan, the marshal, and R.D. Smith, the city treasurer. And this school was named after a man named William Gomer, and he was born in North Carolina in 1811. He died in 1862 right here in Sassoon Valley, and he owned 250 acres of Sassoon Valley, which at the time was $20 an acre. Class hours were from 9 to 4. Uh, the young ones went from 9 to 3. The younger ones sat in front, the older ones sat in the back, and it was very prestigious to sit in the back. You, you earned that, you were older. And the older ones helped the younger ones. The curriculum also was extensive. Ciphering, which is algebra, math, hygiene, bookkeeping, handwriting, spent a lot of time on handwriting. Children packed their lunch in dad's tobacco can because paper bags were scarce. The old 1860 courthouse and jail served the community until 1911, when the time came to construct a new, more advanced structure. 
In 1909, a bond election for the new courthouse had been approved. Soon after the approval, W.A. Jones and E.C. Hemming went to work designing the new building from the plans submitted by Frank Steiger. By November 1, 1911, employees started moving into the building. The new building was completed just north of the old courthouse. In fact, the building was so close, office furniture was moved from the old building to the new one across ramps through the windows. The Board of Supervisors met in the new courthouse for the first time on December 4, 1911. The courthouse is still in use today as it stands on the intersection of Union and Texas Street. It has become one of the most recognizable historic landmarks of our area. The neoclassical revival style of the courthouse was used again in 1913 when the new Armio High School was built. The new school was designed by architect Henry Smith to complement the courthouse, which was directly across the street. An auditorium was added to the north end of the campus in 1931, but it was removed in 1970 to make room for the remodel work when the school building was converted into the present Hall of Justice. By May 1920, a very special monument was added to the front of the courthouse. The Board of Supervisors erected the Winged Victory Monument on Sunday, May 30, 1920. The plaque below the statue reads, Solano County's tribute to its fallen heroes, World's War 1917-1919. By the early 1900s, the Board of Supervisors began to consider plans for a new county hospital to be located on West Texas Street. Fairfield was starting to grow rapidly, and a new hospital seemed like the next step to help accommodate it. The plans were approved on December 7, 1917. However, construction did not begin until December of 1918, due to World War I. By July of 1920, the new hospital opened to the public. The old Fairfield Grammar School, and then um, it was torn down, and I believe, if I'm I don't think I'm wrong, but on the corner of um, Jackson and Texas, right across from the theater, that building there that they've just put new apartments, that was originally the first grammar school. Mrs. Jacobson uh, started the fires in the winter months, and some of us were there early. She took us in there so we'd keep warm. Mrs. Jacobson never forgot her. By 1925, the proud community of Fairfield felt that their town needed a distinguishing mark, a sign that would let visitors know they were in the town of Fairfield. On February 3, 1925, the City Council approved the plans for the new sign. It was finally installed on October 22, 1925, and the lights were turned on the following day. The sign has seen a few changes over the years. However, its design has stayed somewhat the same. The light inside the sign changed from incandescent lighting to neon in 1932. In October of 2002, the sign was renovated with an updated neon section and a new paint job. The community's first library was located on the second floor of the Armio High School building. By 1931, a new library was built on the corner of Texas and Union. It was constructed in the Spanish colonial style 
from the plans submitted by Kaufman, Salberg, and Stanford. It featured ornamental tile, pierced grills, and plaster relief work around the entryway. This library served the community until 1971 when it was moved to its present location at the Civic Center on Kentucky Street. In 1933, a commission for the California Division of Parks was formed to oversee competition for a statue of Chief Solano. Several artists submitted miniature models of Solano to the commission for review. After narrowing down to the eight finalists, William Gordon Huff was chosen to construct the bronze monument. Huff quickly went to work sculpting the 12-foot version of Solano. Since there are no known photos of Chief Solano in existence, Huff modeled the statue based on his own idea of what Solano looked like. He imagined him being a tall, strong man, greeting anyone who may cross his path with a hand raised in friendship. On June 3, 1934, several thousand people attended the statue dedication ceremony that was held on a small hill overlooking West Fairfield, where the CHP truck scales are today. The Solano County Band opened up the ceremonies with a concert followed by a parade of tribes and councils in costume led by the Wahoo Drum Corps of Concord. The program concluded with the unveiling of Chief Solano by Mrs. H. Vance Clymer and a community singing the Star-Spangled Banner. Vandalism took its toll on the statue. In 1938, it was moved to its present location in front of the county library in downtown Fairfield. Generations to come will undoubtedly be inspired by the powerful but friendly looking Indian we all have come to know as Chief Solano, Chief of the Sassoons. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America. The War Department uh, began to consider building an airfield in the center of Solano County shortly after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. Uh, at that time, it was realized that additional air defense was needed for the West Coast. That was the primary factor in this decision. Uh, in addition, uh, Solano County had uh, lots of inexpensive land. Uh, it was also close to uh, the major water and railway transportation hubs and the major east-west highway from San Francisco to points east. Uh, and at the same time, there was good flying weather. The War Department was attracted by the prevailing wind conditions in Solano County. Uh, initially, the base was used by the Navy, among other organizations, uh, to train pilots who were to, of course, take off from carriers. So there were, say, a number of, of motivating factors. In the late 40s, the base was considered a rather desolate and isolated post. Uh, there was not much cultural life between San Francisco and Sacramento in those days. Uh, most of the buildings on the base were regarded simply uh, temporary. They were tar paper and, and wooden frame buildings. Uh, social life was at a minimum. Uh, there were about uh, 2,000 personnel at the base within the first uh, two years. Uh, shortly after that, a first contingent of uh, female soldiers arrived, some 200 wax, but they were out outnumbered by the men by about 10 to 1, so they proved to be very popular. Uh, 
housing was at a premium. Uh, neither Fairfield nor Vacaville at the time uh, had any apartments. Uh, I think there was only one hotel in Fairfield. So it was difficult simply finding housing for these people when they first arrived. Some had to commute as far away as uh, San Francisco or Sacramento. Uh, on the other hand, life was cheap. Uh, you know, pay was not very high, but you could get a, a good lunch, a good meal for about 25 cents. So there were some compensating factors. As the Fairfield Sassoon Army Air Base grew, and with the Second World War, there was a need to house thousands of military personnel. The Federal Housing Administration in Fairfield and Sassoon City began funding an apartment project to be built on the north edge of Fairfield. The Fairfield City Council named the project Waterman Park. At its peak, the project grew to 314 units spread across 25 acres. Most of the apartments were rented out at rates of $60 a month or less. Waterman Park was like a small city adjacent to the city of Fairfield. There was a Waterman Park cafe that served regular dinners every day. The area had its own theater, shopping center, beauty shop, and a weekly newspaper, the Waterman Clipper. Waterman Park provided housing until the late 1960s when it was torn down to make room for the present day Fairfield Civic Center. downtown Fairfield, gosh, we had, what, two or three ice cream parlors, a couple of um, five and dimes, uh, shoe stores, of course I wore rides and that was dresses and all that stuff. The town had everything in it. You didn't have to go out of town to buy a thing. I can see those stores today. <clears throat> yeah. The Air Base, which was usually known as Fairfield Sassoon Army Airfield or Army Air Base during the 40s was changed to Travis Air Force Base in 1951 uh, following the crash of General Travis on the base. Uh, General Travis uh, departed with a squadron of B-29s. Uh, his aircraft was carrying parts of nuclear weapon. Uh, we're not sure what caused the crash at this point. Uh, according to some, the aircraft was overloaded. According to others, uh, one of the props uh, went into a reverse rotation. In any cr case, his airplane crashed on takeoff. Uh, he and another 15 personnel were killed. This was the, the worst disaster ever to occur on the base. And uh, as a result of that, uh, it, was, it was renamed in his, his, his honor. <laughs> Thank you.
but my first paper route was, I would say, uh, when I sold newspapers. And this was when the Daily Republic was downtown across from uh, now is Gordon's Music Shop. Uh, was, was the location of the Solano Republican, or Daily Republican, I forget, but it was one of the names there. And uh, I pick up my 20 newspapers. See, the whole thing is to sell 20 papers a day, and you'd get free passes to the movies uh, at the now Pepper Bellies. You know, they'd give you a pass. I'd start out from, from uh, the downtown area, and I would work um, past the theater, Pass uh, what was it, Woldsworth? Pass Paul's Barber Shop, and there was a pawn uh, a pawn shop there, and then also got into the area of uh, the mobile gas station, George Malden's gas station, I believe, and then uh, it went on further down across Pennsylvania, and then I'd go across the street and uh, go work my way back past uh, it's now the dollar store, but it used to be Lucky's and work back downtown, uh, past Gillespie's Cleaners, which was now uh, the Daily Republic location now. Because even though they had stands, people wanted to buy the papers, so I got a percentage of, of the papers turned in, and you know, it was theater money, <laughs> candy money. <laughs> and then ran into Food Fair, which I met Mr. Emanuel Campus at the time, and I used to call him Mr. Food Fair. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know some of the other uh, people there, like uh, Richie Barracosa and so forth, like that. That was was there. But I remember calling Manuel Campus, who was, became the mayor, as Mr. Food Fair. And those are the days when you know your your mother would say, "Okay, we're making spaghetti for lunch. We'll get some ground beef." So I'd ride my bicycle from from my house on Broadway and Jackson to uh, Food Fair, and I can remember uh, it was thirty three cents a pound for for hamburger, ground beef, to make some spaghetti, and I just go, you know, with 33 cents and the change I had for, for my candy or so. The intensity of work, of operations at Travis, was at its peak during the war in Vietnam. It is not before nor since ever reached that level. During the worst part of that conflict, roughly from 1965 to 1970, more than a million troops a year passed through Travis on their way to Southeast Asia. And at the same time, more than 2,000 wounded troops a month came back from that region. Again to David Grant Medical Center. Travis was also the main reception point for the remains of those soldiers who had been killed in action. All of this activity, of course, was constantly before the public in, in the press. Uh, there was almost a permanent core of reporters at the front gate uh, watching and recording what was taking place here, uh, because Travis, if not providing troops, uh, was also providing support uh, for those on the ground. And so the intensity of the operations of Travis was a strong indicator of, again, the level of our involvement in that part of the world. In March of 1967, the City Council started an architectural competition to select an architect to build the new City Hall and Community Center. The Civic Center would be a big decision for the city for generations to come, and it ought to be done right. Uh, Alan Witt used to say, we ought to go first class. He was the old barber that was on the council about 30 years. And he's the reason those council doors weigh about a ton, <laughs> because he had this thing about doors. Make those council doors big. <laughs> I attended a seminar one time over in San Rafael and got to meet and hear uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, the eminent architect that, that uh, designed the Marin County Civic Center. 
And I remember he made a statement that stuck in my mind about, if I can say it right, uh, we shape our public buildings. After that, they shape us. I thought that public utterance was profound, and it stuck in my mind a long time. And I thought, we better do it right on this one. Each architect that entered the competition had to spend, you know, a few thousand dollars on drawings, and a lot of them had models, and they submitted these all by a certain deadline. They were stacked out in a, a gymnasium, and just, uh, as I recall, about 34 of them, and he could just walk up and down the aisles and look at this concept and look at that model and say, well, that's what I would like this to look like. And, and fortunately, uh, the plan chosen, as I recall, was unanimously chosen. And the two council members on that committee were Alan Witt, the old long-timer, and uh, Pete Lightfoot. Okay, so that was, that was a jury. They came back and they said, this is it. Up to this point, nobody knew who the architect, the witting architect or any architect was. Yeah. After it was chosen, then they made identification, this is the name of the architect. That's how uh, Robert Wayne Hawley was selected as the architect. Construction moved rapidly as the 77,000 square foot complex was completed for a grand opening on May 29, 1971. The opening day ceremony kicked off in front of the four-story, 30,000-square-foot City Hall building. Rockville Park. Now, <clears throat> I assume that's pretty popular with the people now. It wasn't always so. I remember the day when it came to my attention and I saw a subdivision map of Rockville Hills. And my memory said it was about 314 housing units that could be built on that hill. It scared me. It scared the living daylights out of me. Because I didn't think that was good for the valley. I didn't think it was good for Fairfield. I think it would be terrible for Green Valley. And I felt that we had to take bold action. And the man's name was Dennis. And I said, what if we buy this from you? instead of you subdivide it. Would you be interested in that? Because I saw no other way to stop it and stop it with finality. The Rockville Hills land was saved when the developer agreed to sell the property to the city on July 15, 1977. The final cost was $201,096. Well, so much for Rockville Park, and I'm glad people appreciate it and enjoy it, uh, because it took a little sacrifice and controversy to achieve. But I think the vision of that project uh, has blessed not only Fairfield, but Green Valley, the whole area. In the 1970s, J.C. Penney's moved from Texas Street to its current location off of Travis Boulevard. This was the beginning of a project that would vastly change the course of Fairfield's economic future. The building sat there and sat there and sat there for years. But still, we wanted more. We wanted it badly. And 
the region was increasing in population, the Vacaville, uh, Napa, Vallejo, Fairfield. Who would get the regional mall? There would only be one. One day we made contact with Ernest W. Hahn, the Hahn Company, and tried to interest him in building up the mall. Well, he didn't pay too much attention. Uh, he knew we were talking about a big mall, and he wasn't sure the market economics justified a big mall. Without further consultation, he hired an architect to prepare the basic plans, spend thousands of dollars on plans, for a mall to be built there. It would be a mall, utilize an existing penny building, and be built on, I don't know how many acres, 10 or 15 or so, with the Mervins on one end and Penny's on the other end and a few sh shops and stores in between. And that's it, folks. When, when Ernie uh, had his architect unveil these plans and, and proudly announced this was going to be the new Fairfield Mall, and we all looked at the plans, I didn't ask any detailed questions about the plans because I disapproved of the plans. And eyes rolled around a little bit, and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, <clears throat> and I remember this exactly. I said, Ernie, do you like to make money? Make money? Of course I like to make money. Do you really want to make money? Oh, yes. A slight irritation by this point. I said, then do the job right. That's one of our community values. We did it in City Hall. That's how we think and how we feel. Do the job right and put a regional mall in. And finally, I said, Ernie, what if we moved the school and what if we covered the ditch on Travis Boulevard, widened Travis Boulevard, and improved the interchange. Those were the objections you raised. Well, he said, how would you do that? And I said, what if we form a redevelopment project area to raise the capital to make these public improvements? And then <clears throat> the dramatic moment, which I will never forget, he pointed his finger to the architect who was looking at those uh, miserable uh, plans and he said, burn those plans. Those three words, burn those plans. We're going to put a regional mall. Let's get out of here and get started. Between 1979 through 1981, the mall began to take form. With the construction of the mall in good hands, it finally opened on a drizzly morning of March 18, 1981. We sat down with the two new owners plus the existing owner and their representatives and start looking at that entire area 
and uh, start looking at how we could do a project that could really justify uh, going into an area like that, which was a very, very nice area. Um, and so we looked at the open space, okay, there should be a golf course. We all agreed on a golf course. The Rancho Solano Golf Course opened to the public on March 3, 1990. Three years later, on the other side of Interstate 80, Paradise Valley opened its doors on June 21, 1993. This allowed Fairfield residents, as well as its visitors, to enjoy the amenities of two championship golf courses. I think the biggest projects I worked on are, are the area around Solana Mall, the whole, what we call the gateway area, where uh, the Fairfield Redevelopment Agency owned the majority of the land and actually was the one that facilitated the Salon Mall development, which, which was basically just being completed when I came on board. That's when Macy was going to open up. But then we had about 60 acres of land remaining, uh, and we developed that out as primarily as retail um, with um, you know, stores like Toys R Us or uh, you know, the Barnes & Noble is in there now. Um, Kaiser um, Permanente put a medical center in there. Uh, we had uh, a lot of electronic stores, and then we had the Hilton Garden Inn and a number of restaurants going there. And that basically took about 15 years from start to finish uh, to finally build that project out. But I think it's, it's something that uh, will stand the test of time. I think it's a very nice project. One of the, the success stories with Measure C was we're going to do something for every school in the district with the exception of Rodriguez High School, which had just been built prior to Measure C being put on the ballot. Um, so that meant 26 out of 27 schools were getting something, um, in most cases very significant something. In, in some cases for the newer schools, it meant that another neighborhood school would be built and it would relieve overcrowding at those schools. So right now we have 17 elementary schools, we have five middle schools, um, three high schools, we have a continuation high, an alternative high, and we also have an adult school. And so we really have 29 campuses that we're operating, um, and with the exception of Rodriguez High, as I mentioned, and the adult school, everybody will be feeling the positive effects of Measure C. We've had quite an emphasis for about 20 years on trying to, to continue to develop the you know, the streetscape, uh, what people see and feel as they drive down and walk along the streets to the uh, types of retail uses. Uh, important in that, an important part of the strategy was for the city to negotiate with the county to build the county government center, which is currently under construction here in December 2003 and will be completed by 2005. And I think uh, the steps that we've taken with the development of the government center and uh, the creative arts center over time the things that we're doing, the transportation center anchoring the other, other end of the major downtown streets is, uh, is very, very important.
So for everybody that's uh, watching at home watching this, uh, uh, on behalf of the Mayor and City Council, thank you for everything that you allowed us to do uh, to serve you, and uh, especially this past year to, to help you celebrate uh, your 100th birthday as a community. Thanks. Thank you.